You know, I don't know if you guys are like me. Um, I'm assuming probably in some ways that something about me, and I'm not afraid to admit this, is I, I like feeling like I'm on the inside, okay? Like I like feeling like I'm on the know. Like I like the feeling of just like, you know, I know things. I like that. I don't know. I like that. I'm sure probably some of you do, do as well. And as I was thinking about that, and it's kind of happening in our text that we're getting ready to look at, I, I thought of this weird like season in the life of our marriage where myself and my wife, Joanna, were both really into the San Antonio Spurs, the NBA team. It's, weird, it's super weird, like in our marriage history, there was two years, though, where we really, really liked the San Antonio Spurs. We liked them so much that over Christmas break, it was Joanna's idea to go to Memphis to watch the Spurs play the Grizzlies. It was one of the greatest gifts of my life. And so we go. <clears throat> We're going to Memphis, watching the Spurs play, play the Grizzlies. And a simple Google search will actually reveal to you where the team is staying the night in the hotel. It's incredible, okay? So we did a simple Google search. And we found out the hotel where the Spurs were staying the night. And so obviously, because we're very type A, we got there really early. And so we got to the hotel where the Spurs are staying the night, and we're like standing behind these stanchions, and the team buses are there, and it's just us and like a few dudes with tons of memorabilia they want people to sign. And so we're just like hanging out. We're like the married couple that's there. And um, all the other guys, I'm assuming they were single. Actually, I know they were. But like, so we're, we're there, and, and we're like, sitting there, kind of just hanging out, talking. It's really early. And the Spurs back up, power forward, Boris Diaw walks out the door. And I, I know Boris Diaw. I watch the games. And so I was like, hey, Boris Diaw, take a picture with me, which is a very weird sentence as an adult man to say to another adult man. <laughs> and so I'm like yelling at him, and Boris is like, he walks by, and, and he's like, comes up to me and my wife, and, and he's like, I'll take a picture with you, but first I need to go get some coffee, which seems like a weird thing to drink before you're getting ready to play a professional sport. Okay, so, but we know Boris is there. We know he's coming out. <clears throat> and that's when, and then like people started showing up. Okay, and it took Boris a long time to get that coffee. And so we're like, people are showing up and they're like, you know, are we even at the right hotel? And, I'm, and we're like, oh, you are. Oh, we saw Boris Diaw come out. And then they're like, oh, okay, okay. Like, yeah, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but like, Boris, he's getting some coffee. He'll be right back. Because we were like basically his best friend at this point. And so like we're sitting there and then Boris comes back and he's double fist and two venti drinks from Starbucks, okay? Which again, seems like a bad idea right before you play basketball. And, but here's the thing. I end up getting this picture with me and Boris Dio. <laughs> he looks super into it too, doesn't he? <laughs> Like, him and I are basically best friends. Like, I don't know, me and Boris, like, that's it. Why am I making that face? I have no idea. Why am I wearing glasses? I have no idea. But I'm just saying it happened. And for a minute, I felt like me and Boris were tight. Felt good. Felt like I was an insider. And there's something about that feeling that's kind of fun. There's something about the feeling of kind of feeling like you know things, feeling like you're on the inside track. And the text that we come to this morning is one where that is the disciples' reality. That's the disciples' reality as it pertains to their relationship with Jesus. They're aware to some extent that Jesus is special. To some extent, they're aware that he's different. To some extent, they're aware, and as, as aware as they are, there's also a part of them that doesn't want other people to come in on what they are experiencing. Look at this. This is in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 9. And we'll pick up in verse 38. This is John. John came to Jesus, and he said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now think about this idea of like insider status. When it came to the, like Jesus had 12 disciples who were like following him around. Inside the group of 12, there was three that were like even more insiders. That if you, if you remember when Jesus went up on the mountain and he was like, the glory of God came through him. Jesus didn't bring all 12, he only brought three. And the three that he brought was Peter, 
James, and John. So John is like quintessential insider to the ministry of Jesus. And, and he, he likes that. That he likes it so much that as this other person who's not one of the twelve is casting out demons, John's response to him is, we need to stop him. And, and I think it's really interesting because the reason why. Like, if you look at John's issue with the guy casting out demons, that it wasn't that this is a man without character. He wasn't like, oh, this guy, like, he, he does, no, it, it wasn't his character. It wasn't the fact that he was doing it in a way that didn't please God. It wasn't any of that. But what was John's real issue with the man that so, so significant that he tried to stop him? It was that he wasn't following them. He didn't care that he wasn't following Jesus. He's like, he wasn't following us. And so basically what John is saying is he's like, Jesus, this guy's casting out demons and we tried to stop him because, because he's an outsider and we are insiders. And if you really think about that, honestly, like, the dude's an insider. I mean, think about this guy. He has to be an insider. He, he's, he's casting out demons empowered by God. That kind of seems like something that an insider would be aware of. That, that he's casting out demons in the authority of Jesus' name, which again seems like something. That, that he's literally doing the work that when Jesus called the 12 to himself to do, he's literally doing the work that they were called to do. So if you ask me, yeah, he might not be one of the 12, but he's certainly on the team, that he's certainly an insider, that he certainly should be allowed to do the ministry. And what comes next is Jesus teaches John something that's really important about the kingdom of God. Look at this. He says this, but Jesus said to him, <clears throat> so John's like, he wasn't one of us, so we tried to stop him. And, J and Jesus said, don't stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. This is a little bit of Jesus, like, kind of joking. Like, he's saying, John, demons are bad. This guy's casting them out. I think it would actually be a bad thing to stop the guy who's doing the good thing. Like if you watch a superhero movie, usually the superhero stops the bad guys. This guy is stopping the bad guys. You should be cool. And I think something that John doesn't, doesn't realize is he doesn't realize there are plenty of demons for everyone to cast out. But what Jesus is showing us here is he's showing us something that's really important as it pertains to the kingdom of God. And it's that, <clears throat> the kingdom of God, it's not a business. It's not something where you get your corner of the market and you just kind of stay. No, the kingdom of God is something where as long as people are preaching the gospel, preaching the exclusivity of Jesus, the authority of scripture, then you need to help them do what they're supposed to do. But there isn't like an us and them, but no, it's, it's us. We, we all exist to help people know Jesus better. And that's one of the things about New Life that I'm actually really proud of is that we, we do a lot of things to partner with other churches because they exist to help people know Jesus better. Um, you might be aware of some of these things, but I think it's worth noting that there's a, there's a couple churches that meet actually on our property. Uh, there's a church that meets after our 11 o'clock service. It's called the Ozark Mountain Deaf Church. And uh, they meet every week after the 11 o'clock service. And they have been meeting on our property since before the pastor who was before me, Pastor Dan Cole. So they've been here forever. They meet here. If you ever come after the 11, you might see them setting up. They're very nice. Um, then we also have this, another church that meets. It's meeting right now in the building that is not attached to our building. And it's called Springfield Chinese Home of Christ. And, and they meet here. And, and it, it's really cool because they wanted a Chinese service for them. But, they want, but their kids were American, and so they wanted something Americanized 
for their kids. So they, they, their kids and their youth, they go to our program and they meet in the building over there and do their own thing. It's kind of neat. A lot of people don't know this, but it's kind of, I'm proud of this, that, that our notes from the Philippian series, last fall, there are three churches in southern Missouri that are using our notes for the Philippian series, two in Kansas City and one in Poplar Bluff. It's pretty cool. Like, we, they're helping people know Jesus better, and so, hey, anything that we can do, we're on the same team. Now, maybe if you're sitting here thinking critically, you're like, but hold on. I mean, they're, they're getting people that, like, you're not going to get. I mean, so, like, I mean, come on, man. Like, don't do that. And I would say, you know, you're right. Praise the Lord that they are doing, that they do reach people that we won't reach. But there's also a church that, like, does, that we partner with. Um, I don't know if you guys, if you're on social media, you probably have heard of Limitless Church, maybe? Um, it's a church that recently started at the Y on Republic Road. And I was having lunch with their pastor, real good dude, and uh, we were talking, and he was just talking about how, like, he's got these huge trailers, okay, because they have to set up the YMCA every Sunday morning and turn it into a church, which just sounds like a lot of work I don't want to do. And so, and so he has to do that, and he, we were talking, and he's like, the worst part is, in fact, that we have to set it up, he's like, the worst part is that I have to pay to park the trailers, He's like, I have to take you to a storage unit, and I'm just paying money just to put these trailers here because at the Y, like, I can't, I can't park it there because there are people that are there. And so I was like, well, dude, we have a parking lot that sits open, like, six days of the week. Like, you can just, you can use our parking lot. So if you ever drive by on, during the week, you'll see two humongous trailers in the back of our parking lot. And here's the thing, like, we don't, like, we didn't, like, break in there and, like, cut their wires and, like, mess with their computers and stuff and change all their passwords. Like, we'll show them. Like, no, like, we're happy to help. It's a way that we can serve because, I mean, they, they're helping people know Jesus better. If you ever watched their promo video, I'm not going to ask you why because I know you're not looking for another church, but if you did watch their promo video, <laughs> you might have saw this, this clip in their promo video, and I, I think it's kind of cool. It's Pastor Stone. Does that look familiar to you? That's our kids' stage. They filmed their promo video at our kids, like in our kids' room. It's a church that's like three miles away from here. Why? Why let that happen? Because we're on the same team. Because there is a heaven to gain, a hell to lose. There are people in Springfield who need to know Jesus better. He's not against us, he's for us. Man, praise the Lord that there's another church. And so we'll, hey, whatever we can do to help it, make it happen. And so like, like John's complaint to Jesus would be very similar to like someone coming up to me after service and saying, Pastor Ryan, did you hear about Limitless Church? I mean, seriously, they're going to take people away from new life. Like, are we cool with that? And Jesus' response would be like, they're not against us. They're for us. Praise the Lord that there are more people that are helping people know Jesus better. And anything we can do to help them, we will. And so then what comes next here is really interesting because what, what, what Jesus does in his, like, he's, Jesus is brilliant. So John comes and brings this to them. And then what Jesus does is he has this way where he shows John, not only are you wrong, but you're also a hypocrite. Look at this. He says, for truly I say to you, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Okay, like this this verse could be like a sermon, okay? Because so many things are happening here in this verse. One of the things I think is so cool about this verse is what Jesus is saying is he's, he's saying to give someone a drink of water is the same, like the same level as casting out a demon, that like in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as a little job. Like there's like the worship team doesn't get more points than someone who works in the back. No, it's like it's, it's, there's no job that is insignificant in the kingdom of God, whether you're casting out demons or whether you're giving people water who belong to Jesus. That's what he's saying. But, but he's making a point here that's worth, that's worth drawing out. And it's, it's this, is he's saying, John, We've been doing ministry for about two and a half years. And, the, and, and you would agree, John, that we've been able to do ministry for the last two and a half years because of the hospitality of other people. He's like, and, and you believe 
that, that God is going to reward them for their hospitality? Well, they're not part of the 12. So why is it that you have an issue with this guy who's casting out demons not being part of the 12? If you're okay with them being in the kingdom, then why aren't you okay with this guy too? And, and so it's this incredible thing that's happening, and he's saying, he's saying it, they belong to Christ. Like, what, what was the issue? The issue is that they, John was upset that they didn't belong to them. And Jesus is like, it's not about belonging to you. It's about belonging to me. And they belong to me, so you should be cool with what they're doing. And so there's a lot happening. These are four verses, and, and there's so many things happening. But I would just draw out like three themes that you see throughout these four verses. And, and the first theme that I would, I would look at is the theme of unity. That unity in, is throughout. That what Jesus is saying is he's saying that when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to the work that God has called us to do, we have got to be, we've got to realize that we have a common goal, we have a common purpose, and that should bring us together. And I would point out here too that when I'm talking about unity, that unity doesn't mean that you don't disagree. Unity has to do with what you do with disagreement. That we have a teaching team and we meet every Wednesday, we meet every Wednesday at like 9 o'clock, and what we do in the teaching team, I send them my notes, and we talk about this, the message. And here's what I can tell you about teaching team. <laughs> there are times it gets heated. Voices will raise sometimes. I have said to Ryan Zafroff before in teaching team, I've said, are you literally trying to kill every single one of my ideas? Like, and so, I mean, like, it gets, it gets intense. Like, it gets kind of whatever. And, and here's what happens usually, okay? There'll be two people, and they will, like, be arguing and kind of discussing the text. And what ends up happening every single time is that someone's idea is taken and someone's idea is not. Unity handles that situation. When their idea wasn't taken, Unity says, you know, I don't really see that, but we have a goal that's greater, so I'm not going to really do anything about it. That's what Unity says. What disunity does is disunity would say, I am going to get as many people on my team as possible. That when, as soon as Ryan says it, I'm going to be out in the lobby and I'm going to tell everyone why I think that's wrong and why I'm right. One of those could significantly hinder the effectiveness of the church. It's about being united. It's about realizing, hey, we're all on the same page, that we need to be pulling this thing in the same direction. This is why Jesus says this to, to John. He says, he says, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to, to afterwards, to soon afterwards, speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. And so as it pertains to unity, I think there's a few ways this kind of fleshes itself out. One would be like unity in this, like in terms of this church. I'm going to make a promise to you, okay? And I promise this to you. We will do things that you don't like. I, prom I, I promise. Like there are going to be things that are going to happen where you're going to be like, yeah, I wouldn't have done it that way. I, I promise. And if that's not the case, just hold on. It's coming, okay? So I'm just telling you, like that'll happen. Now, when that does, you get two options. If, if it's a really big deal, and it's like, I just can't move past this, I think this is wrong, then what you need to do is you need to find someone with authority, someone on staff, and you need to tell them your concern. If it's that big of a deal, like you, you owe that to yourself, and like that's, that's how you need to handle that. But, here, but here's what you don't need to do is you don't need to find as many people around you to like come on your team to create disunity because what that does is, is that hinders our ability to help people know Jesus better because disunity, what it does is it makes it hard to do the mission. So Jesus is saying, hey, if they're not against us, they're for us. So we're all in this together. That's kind of what he's saying. So it works that way in this church when there's an issue and I promise they'll come and that's how you do it. Or you say, you know what? It's not that big of a deal. I'll just move on. Or it's, this is a really big deal. You're not going to see eye to eye, and then you, you should probably leave. Like, that's probably what you got to do. 
And, and then there's also, I would say, issues of, of unity as it pertains to our relationship with other churches. I would bet that you all have friends that attend churches that are not new life. And, and I think that's great. When your friends who attend churches that aren't new life are inviting people, you should be like, you should go. <laughs> it's a great church. <laughs> that when you have friends who like, maybe they're like promoting an event, or you should pray for those churches. You should root for their success. You shouldn't like do things to try to undercut and short. Their, if they are preaching the gospel, then we're on the same team. We need to work. There's a, there are enough people in Springfield who need to hear the gospel that we all have room. And so the unity, like Jesus is calling us to unity. And not only would I say you need that, but there's also this like interpersonal unity that's important with you. The chances are in your life that someone, and this is primarily talking probably to, to your relationship with like people who are Christians, but what's going to happen is at some point in your life, someone who's a Christian is going to do something to offend you. They're going to maybe say something, they're going to do something that's going to offend you, or maybe it's going to be something you see them do that you didn't like them to do, or it could be something even where, like, you know, you heard about something and you're offended. Unity is really important in that situation. And the way that Jesus would say that you handle that situation isn't that you go and get a bunch of people to hear what you have to say and to agree with you, but what Jesus would say is that when that happens, when someone sins against you for the sake of unity, for the sake of reconciliation, you need to go and talk to that person about that situation. Look at what he says here in Matthew's Gospel. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 15. Jesus says this, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen... Take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Now, it seems like when Christians get like offended, they do it backwards, right? I'm going to tell everyone in the church about my problem, except the one person who can actually do something about it. And I'm going to get all these people on my mind. And then finally, a Christian will rise up in that scenario and they'll say, you know what, you probably should talk to them. And then you finally bring it to the person. And obviously, they don't receive it well because you've already told everyone else except for them. That Jesus is saying, if, if you have an issue with someone, you need to talk to them. That you need to tell them about it. That your goal should be, and then, and then if you bring it to them and it doesn't work, they don't hear you, they don't agree, you don't, then, then get some people who also love Jesus, bring them with you, and then try that. And then, then after that, then you bring it to, like, that's what he's saying. And I would just give, a, like, kind of a word to you here. Like, there are some people who are like, <clears throat> people like to bring their problems to you. They like to bring their offenses to you. And you might even think to yourself, you'd say, you know, Ryan, people just like to talk to me. And to you, I would say, please, please don't act like that's a compliment to yourself. Because all you're doing is enabling people to sin. All you're doing is providing a place for them to sin and not obey Jesus. So when someone comes to you with a problem, your response shouldn't be, give me more information. No, your response should be, let's go talk to the other person. Because Jesus is saying, unity matters. And we have to fight for it. That's why Jesus says what he says. So you see unity in the text. Then you see this. You see jealousy come out in the text. So you have, you have unity and you have jealousy. And jealousy, it's a sin however you slice it. And, and I know that no one here is jealous of anybody, but, but your friends are, and so you can help them with that. And jealousy is a sin, like, however you slice it. And it's one of those sins where it's like, it's tricky. And a lot of commentators, like, they speculate. And you can't know John's heart. You can't know why he came to Jesus with the complaint that he had. Like, you don't really know. But this is where expository preaching can be really, really helpful. Because what expository preaching does is when you walk through verses, verse by verse, you get a larger context of what's happening in the book. 
And so if you remember a few chapters, a few, actually a few verses ago, this happened. This is in Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 9, verse, 9, verse 17. Someone comes to Jesus and they say, Teacher, I brought to you my son, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. So the last time there was a demon in Mark's gospel, the disciples couldn't cast it out. Then you have last week, what we talked about, and last week the disciples, Jesus is telling them that he's going to die and he's going to raise, whatever, and the disciples don't want anything to hear, they don't want to hear anything about that. They're just arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest. And then they have this guy comes on the scene. And what was John's issue? He says, teacher, we saw someone casting out a demon in your name. He's saying, they're able to do something last time that we weren't able to do. Last time we couldn't cast out a demon, but here's this guy who's not one of us, and he's able to do it. Maybe he's the greatest, and so he's jealous. He's jealous of what this guy can do that he was unable to do. And here's the question for you. What do you do in your life when you find out or when you say that someone is better than you at something? What do you do? Do you lie to yourself and tell yourself that isn't true? Do you, do you find out, like, do you look for them to mess up? And you just kind of like point out the things where they mess up. Do you, do you come up with ways to like subtly like sabotage what they're doing? Do you try to stop them? This is what John's trying to do. He's trying to do because he's jealous. He wants to be the greatest. And now you have someone who's not even one of them who's doing something that John's unable to do. And, and what I found is, so what do you do with jealousy? Well, one of the things you do when you're jealous is you figure out a way to celebrate the success of other people. And it's weird, but I promise when you do that, it doesn't make you feel stupid. It actually is incredibly, like, empowering. You know, for me, I, like, I, what I, I'm, I'm competitive at a few things. And the things I'm competitive at, like, I'm not, uh, like, I will regularly say, oh, well, yeah, they're better than me at that. Oh, that, that they're more, and, and, and honestly, the first time I did it, I thought, man, I'm gonna feel so stupid saying that out loud. And it's weird, but there's just a grace that God gives. And when you, when you see that, when you're not afraid to say it, it's weird because what God does is he shows, he kind of helps you be more comfortable with who he's called you to be and what he's called you to do. Jealousy can't do that, though. And you have to realize, too, that just because someone's star is shining doesn't make yours any dimmer. That what John couldn't see was he couldn't see there are plenty of demons for them all to cast out. Eventually, he will figure it out, and when he does, he needs this guy on their team. That jealousy has this way of hindering our ability to be effective in what God has called us to do. So you see that theme work its way throughout. And then finally, you see the theme of what I would call fruit and root. Fruit and root. And, And I just, I think it's so interesting but here you have Jesus, two, he's, you know, been with these guys for two and a half years. He's got six months until he goes to the cross. And he's got these disciples who, last time they were confronted with the demon, they were unable to cast it out. And now there's this guy who hasn't been with them at all. And he's able to do something that his disciples can't do in the moment. And like, if I'm Jesus, I'm like, okay, I got six months left. How do I get out of these guys? Like, can I move off and maybe move to someone else? Like, because I mean, frankly, the reason why the guy's able to cast out the demons and the disciples can is because his root was right. And theirs wasn't. And yet, even as that's true, you see this incredible thing that Jesus says to the disciples in the middle of this text. Look at what he says. He says, For truly I say to you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink to you because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. He's telling them something incredibly beautiful about the gospel. 
he's saying, even in spite of all the things they've done wrong, I mean, and, and really the last three chapters have just been them failing over and over again. And what does Jesus say to them? He says, you belong to me. And this is what this shows us about the gospel. It's not about what we do. That if it was about what they did, they would not belong. That if it was about their ability to perform, if it was about their ability to do a task, they would not belong. But because that's not what it's about, because it's about Jesus and what he did, he's able to look at them in in spite of all of their failures and say, no, you belong to me. And maybe you're here in this room and you look at your life and the totality of your life is one that is so full of guilt that maybe a lot of us wouldn't even understand. Here's the beauty of the gospel for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. He wants you to belong to him. That if it was about what we did, no one could make it. But the gospel is about what he did. So it gives everyone a shot. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we're thankful for the grace that you show us. We're thankful, God, for the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel that says that we can belong to you no matter what. And I just pray for us this morning as I think about the text and how it pertains to this church. I pray that we'd be a group of people that are united. I do. I pray that we'd be united in mission, that we'd be united in purpose, that you would help us to be effective in the task that you've given us, which is to help people know Jesus better. Help us with that, God. I pray for those of us maybe who are struggling with jealousy. Maybe there's someone in our circle who is better than we are, and it's just killing us. I pray, God, that you would help speak to people's hearts and let them know it's okay. Let them know that you have wired them specially, that you have gifted them uniquely and that you have, given, you have a purpose for them. Maybe that's not why they're jealous. Maybe it's just they don't feel like they're getting the opportunities that, that, that they should be getting and whatever the case may be. And because of that, they're jealous. I pray, God, that by your grace that you would help them to see that there's plenty of work to be done and that you know ultimately what you're doing. And then I pray for all of us as we think about fruit. We think about root. Thank you, God, that the gospel that the gospel isn't on the basis of what we've done, but it's on the basis of Jesus and what he's done. And if there's anyone here who has not put their trust in that, I pray, God, by the power of your spirit, that you'd make them aware of the beauty of the gospel, that you would give them a new heart and that you'd save them. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for watching us on YouTube today. We hope that the content that you heard helped you know Jesus better. Also, don't forget to click subscribe and to click the bell icon so that you'll get notified every time our channel drops a new video. If you would like to partner with us and what God is doing here at New Life, there are three ways that you can give. You can give by mailing a check to the church. You can give by going to giving.nlspringfield.com or you can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. And if you would like to connect with us in any other way, you can visit us at nlspringfield.com, click on the connect tab, and we will get back to you as soon as we can. See you next week.